Hello and welcome to the 14th episode of Born in Quarantine. In the last episode we talked about Iranian cinema, what is it, and Bahram Beizrei and Masoud Kimiai and how they define their cinema in relation to Iranian culture and Iranian literature. Let's continue to do that. This is part two of Iranian cinema. As you may have guessed, keeping with the tradition of last episode, we have Devil's Switch here again and uh, but this time I have put this, it's called Nabot. It's basically a stick made out of sugar and saffron. And uh, it's supposed to make it more tolerable. It does, but not by much. It's still tea. In defense of tea though, it's not like I just hate tea. I don't like many hot beverages. I'm not a big fan of coffee either. The only hot beverage I can sort of stand is hot chocolate and even that... In very short bursts, you know, not, not for long periods of time. I don't drink hot chocolate regularly either. I'm a cold drink fan. So, where we left off, we were talking about Masoud Kimiai. And we talked about his movie, Qaysa. So, let's begin this one by giving a little history about something called the Iranian New Wave of Cinema. By the way, that's a tambour. It's an instrument that I don't know how to play. Uh, my mother actually plays one. But I will promise you that somewhere through the episode, I will pick it up and I will try to play something for you and I will fail miserably. 1960s has been a very influential year in cinema history. Not just in Iran, in the whole world. And one of the main important parts of it was, to my chagrin, the French New Wave, Jean-Luc Godard and François Truffaut. So the New Wave became sort of a staple. In the late 60s, early 70s, in Iran, which would mean somewhere around um, mid to late uh, 1340s, I think, there was this movement that historians call Iranian New Wave of Cinema. Whether or not it's actually a movement or not, whether it should be called a New Wave or not, is a long discussion. I am in the camp that says, yes, it was a New Wave because Iranian cinema changed at that time. But there are many who do not accept that because unlike many other New Waves, this one did not have a centralized figure. It happened completely by accident. <laughs> there are three movies credited well, with starting the new wave. Masoud Kimiai's Qaysa, which we talked about in the last episode, Darush Mehdi's Gav, roughly translated to The Cow, and Nasser Taghwai's Awamish Dar Huzur Digaran, roughly translated to Calmness in the Presence of Others. Now, there are many debates on whether or not it's just these three movies some people accept that a movie called Hassan the Bald by Ali Hatami is also in there some people want to put the brick and mirror but the, by the one hit wonder by Megolestan in there but these three are the ones that most just accept and they broadened the Iranian culture in cinema. Darisha Mehdi gave us sophisticated socialist ideas and this whole critique of old Iranian ideologies. Masoud Kimiai gave us this rough, gritty view of what it's like for the average public to live in this country. (laughs) 
and calmness in the presence of others, which is a weird movie. And I do mean weird. Nasser Taqwi is a weird director. And uh, maybe one day I'll talk about him too, but it's very weird. And calmness in the presence of others showed the Iranian public that they do not just need a story to have an experience in cinema, something that all of the world knew, but for Iranian cinema, it was a first. Even Brick and Mirror, for the most part, was a very centralized story. It uh, helps to also mix it. Apparently, all of the dissolved ones are in the bottom. It is actually more tolerable this way. After the Iranian New Wave, it was just avalanche of good Iranian movies. You got people like Feridun Gole and Samuel Khachikian come in and create these amazing movies, Amir and Adevi. And suddenly Iranian public weren't just throwing them away. They were actually going and watching them because they had these great memories of Gov, the cow, and Reysar. And they wanted more and Iranian cinema was ready to give them more. Then the revolution happened and all of that was thrown out of the window. Iranian revolution, I have to say, took a giant pin and put it in the history of cinema, effectively cutting it off. Because for the first few years of Iranian revolution, nothing would happen. Then in the 80s, 1980s, which would mean 1360s in the Iranian cinema, there were some good movies. It was a golden age of sorts. There were a lot of good movies by a lot of young directors like Abbas Kiarostami and a lot of old directors like Daish Mehji. But after that, we don't talk about after that because God is the Iranian cinema in shit holes now. <laughs> but through Iranian New Wave came also another concept, a personal style, which a lot of directors just did not have. Nasser Taqwai, as much as I love him, did not have a personal style. Darish Mehdri either. The guy that sort of cemented his stamp was Masud Kimiai with Qaysar. And with his next movie, which I'm going to talk about, Gavazanha, roughly translated to the Deers, which came out at the early 1970s. <laughs> The Deers, or I'm just going to call it Gavazn House, sorry, I know I've tried to call every movie by its English name, but The Deers is just weird for me. Gavazn House highlighted a problem that sort of made everyone worry. It was a good movie, it has a new story, but it was eerily similar to Qaysar. It told the story of two friends, one of them brought down by all of the problems in his life, and the other one, a sort of Marxist a revolutionary that is wanted and helps his friend to rise up and fight against the system. Sort of like Reza. It highlighted something worrying. Is this how Masoud Kimiai knows to tell a story? Can he do anything else? Now, let me tell you, it's been more than 40 years since Reza and Gavaz Nha came out. And Master Kimiei has made a lot of movies during this time, both before and after the revolution. And that worry was very just. He has made 40 different versions of Kaysa. <laughs> he changes it sometimes. Metropole has a female ma main character instead of a male one. Or Ziafat has two main characters instead of one. But all of them are just Qaysar, just different versions of Qaysar. And at some point, everything good about the Qaysar, which meant the dialogue and the universe, became very, very outdated because the world moved on. But Masri Kimiai is stuck in this time frame of late 60s, early 70s. And yeah, <laughs> it's kind of funny to watch. To go and watch... Uh, Master the Kimi movie, you already know what you're going to watch. There is this difference between having a style and having nothing else to add to your style. People often confuse these two. Master the Kimi definitely has a style, but the problem is he has never stepped foot outside of it, so we know if his style works in other places as well. 
because he's a good director, let me tell you this. He's a good writer and he's a good director. If only you could see him do something else and see what he can do other than his normal shtick. But imagine, if you can, you have Bahama Beizai and his connection to Iranian literature. And you have Masud Kimiai and his connection to Iranian everyday culture. Well, what would happen if you mix these two? You would have the perfect director, am I right? Well, we did. We had the late, the amazing, and the massively, massively influential Ali Hatami. Any Iranian over the age of 12, I think, probably remembers seeing two movies. First, Ruse Vare, roughly translated to Day of Occurrence, I think. It's written by Bahram Abezai. It's a good movie, it's a religious movie, and it happens to be appeared on Iranian TV a lot, and I mean a lot. So probably if you're over the age of 12 and you once turned on the TV, you've probably watched The Day of Occurrence. The other one is this movie. Ali Hatami's masterpiece, Madar, or Mother. Because it is a wholesome movie, it tells the story of the mother of a family who feels her death is drawing near, and, well, she gathers all of her children just to get ready to die. It's a very weird story if you look at it through a realism window but if you look at it through a literature window it's actually very common in Iranian literature you know the premonitions that someone thinks I might die and they have this calmness to them and they get ready to die there is this very weird anecdote I think about one of the Iranian poets called Attar he had an apothecary store and he worked there for almost 40 years. One day, a sort of wise man, a dervish, walks by him and tells him that, you know, he has no need for material positions. Atos says, so i sorry, I don't remember the anecdote very well. I was told about it like when I was in middle school. And the end is the wise man laughs at Atta for his ignorance lies down in front of his store and dies right there and there and Atar is so flabbergasted by it that he sells his store and becomes a poet and a, well a sort of scholar and he's a good poet by the way he's a good poet I love some of his poems so this premonition this sort of spiritual connections beyond just religious beliefs this spiritual connections to another world is very much embedded in Iranian literature and thus in Iranian culture. Almost all of the older generations in Iran have this idea of their death that it will be very calming, even though the younger generations, including me, we, I don't think we have that anymore. <laughs> we have very much fear of death. So the mother is going to die and he has all of his children. There is a misconception there, and I want to address it because if you hear people talk about this movie, they will probably mention this, and it is wrong by any mean of the word. They say mother in this movie is sort of an allegory for Iran herself, and all of his children are representatives of different classes of people. It's not. It's just this story. There is no way that that allegory works in this movie with how the story goes forward. It's just this very weird family. Yes, I know it's weird that the older son played brilliantly, and I do mean brilliantly. It's one of the best performances of all of cinema history by Muhammad Ali Keshavaz, who is a fog, 
and you have the very soft-spoken, very spiritual, very poetic younger brother played by Amin Atarok. And then you have the mentally challenged brother played by Akbar Abdi. It's weird that all of them inhabit the same family, but it's not because they represent different classes of people. It doesn't make sense. That allegory falls apart by the halfway when the older brother attacks the younger brother, but the stepbrother, yes, because they have the same father but different mothers, comes and holds his belt and he sort of just becomes very neutralized. What does it represent in your allegory? It doesn't make sense. I want you. And I am kind of mad about this allegory, so I'm going to try to do this. I played whatever I was playing and I hope my voice distracted you from how bad I was playing this. Ali Hatami had a very weird way of working with words. His dialogues are very much all in his own style. The most famous one which is written on his tombstone actually is Aine Chirag Khamushinis. Roughly translated to, it's not the creed of the lamp to bring about the darkness. He has a very poetic view. He's very much indebted to uh, Iranian literature. But if Bahama Beyzei is indebted to Shahnameh and Ferdowsi's work, Ali Atami is very much indebted to Hafez and Molavi and more spiritual ways than mythical ways. Yet, when he comes to writing the everyday people, he doesn't do it like Bahama Beyzei does. Bahama Beyzei looks at all humans as mythical creatures. Ali Atami looks at certain characters as these mythical poetic characters and some characters are just normal characters. So in Mother, for example, you have the younger brother who is very poetic. Then you have the older brother who is a fuck and just speaks like one. He doesn't do poetic stuff. He uses everyday uh, expressions. Usually you would think they don't mix well in the universe, but in Ali Hatami's universe, to his direction, his word building, it bonds together seamlessly. In another one of his movies, and another great one of his movies, Kamal al-Mulk, which cannot be roughly translated because, well, it's, uh, it's a name of a guy. <laughs> it is more apparent because the characters are from um, another time period. The Kamal al-Mulk tells the story of the painter, Kamal al-Mulk, who was working for Nasreddin Shah Qajar, which was more than 200 years ago, I think. I know it's more than 100 years ago, I think it's 200 years ago, and he lived all the way to Reza Shah Pahlavi, which was 1920 to 1940s, or in Persian calendar, it was 1300s to 1320s, because then he was, actually, he was discrowned in the uh, summer of 1320, in the middle of World War II. And it's sort of a view to add the history of Iran at that time, through the eyes of this artist. And Kamal al-Mulk is an allegory for the, all of the artists, unlike Mother. Nobody talks about the allegory in Kamal al-Mulk because art at some point, even to this day, has always been sort of the add-on to the crown. And most of the artists that we know nowadays are the ones that were close to the crown. Yet as modernism came with Reza Shah, one of the things that gathered power were the artists, and we know a lot of artists that were not exactly connected to the crown. And the dialogue in Kamal or Molk is somewhat poetic. But when it comes to Muzaffar Din Shah, which was a notorious idiot, <laughs> Uh, the dialect doesn't try to make him appear smarter. He is an 
ایدیت همه چیزمان باید به همه چیزمان بیاید اتابک بدش نیاید ما که صد رزم مثل بیست مارک نداریم که نکاش باشی آنطوری داشته باشیم بیلدی بیلد تو گنده That man gave us cinema, he bought a camera and made Iranian cinema history possible. How? How? Aside from that, unlike Bahram Abezai who had a very sort of recorded play look to his movies, Ali Hatami is actually a very good director. All of his movies have their own style in shot composition, in editing, in color which is something Iranian cinema usually ignores very much. But in Ali Hatami movies, you just know you're watching the Ali Hatami movie because colors are very warm. There are rarely scenes that have cold colors, but if they do, which is something that happened in the movie, I think, suited the land, I cannot even fathom to think what it would mean in English. Sorry, I can't roughly translate it. I will look it up and put it here. The end scenes are very cold in terms of color and it is because something bad is about to happen the same way in mother there is this scene that is very cold in terms of color correction and lighting and it is the last uh, visit between mother and her husband the father of the kids so when something is cold it means that things are going bad so Ali Hatemi is a very weird director When I watch Ali Hatami movies, I cannot imagine Ali Hatami working in another country other than Iran. And that is a big problem. You have to have an understanding of Iranian culture in order to fully understand Ali Hatami movies. A lot of it will come off as unrealistic. Why would the mother bring all of his children to when she dies? Why would the children accept? You have to realize that in Iranian literature it is very common to have these sort of premonition and in Iranian culture there is this kind of uh, ridiculous idea that whatever your parent tell you out of respect you should do don't question it just do it an old way of thinking I've managed to drink half of this it's it's a lot for me I don't like tea but I do like dates these are very delicious and yes this is an excuse for me to just eat some dates so this is for me the Iranian cinema to some extent Iranian cinema is having a lot more rich nowadays I mean we've had in these following years a Palme d'Or from Cannes Film Festival for Abbas Kiyostami we had two Academy Awards for Asghar Farhadi first one Good movie. Second one, a shitty movie. Salesman is bad. And I mean bad, bad movie. But for me, when I'm talking about an Iranian cinema, I want something that I can't find outside of Iran. It's when I call that movie an Iranian movie. Something that is very unique to this culture. Abbas Kiyostami is a very good director. Taste of Cherry is one of my favorite movies, but it's not very much embedded in Iranian culture. I can see Abbas Kiyostami work in another culture, such as Japan, which he did. And it was a good movie, so... But Bahram Beizai, Mas'ud Kimiai, Ali Hatami, and there are others like Nasser Taghvai or Amir Nadevi or Feridun Gole that I would put there, but these three for me sort of represent the Iranian cinema as what it never got allowed to be. There are a lot of people trying to imitate Bahram Beizai or Masada Kimiai or Ali Hatami, all of them failing miserably. But Iranian cinema has always these directors to look at in its history. And that is why I even ponder Iranian cinema history. They are good movies. Mother is a masterpiece. Killing Mad Dogs is a masterpiece. Qaysar is a masterpiece. They are very good movies that I think there is a wave of, I don't know, unwanted criticism is a bad word. Unwarranted criticism that attacks these movies simply because they are Iranian. Throughout Iran, I'm not talking internationally. I don't think anyone internationally even cares about these movies. And it's a shame because when I want to talk to someone about Iranian cinema, I don't talk about Majid Majidi or Asghar Farhadi. I want to talk about Ali Hatami. 
But there is this unwarranted criticism that attacks these movies simply because they are Iranian, because people think that since they are Iranian, they can't be good, right? Which is something I understand. The amount of shit in Iranian cinema is just beyond count. I mean beyond count. You can't go to a movie nowadays, to a movie theater, and see a movie that isn't either a C-grade comedy or a movie trying very hard to have a message and uh, be like an Asghar Farhadi movie, which means a lot of shaky camera and no style and very, very cringy dialogue. So yeah, you go and watch them, and this is your idea of Iranian cinema. It's a bad thing. But being bad doesn't mean that it was always bad. In a dump heap, you can find a few, few little gems. And to ignore those gems is sort of idiotic. The reason I praise Bahar Beyzei is he didn't come and say, forget whatever you saw before me, and I'm going to just give you this new thing, because that is idiotic. He said, let me tell you what I've seen in the past, and I'll add my own stuff to it, and create this harmonious thing that creates amazing movies such as Death of Yazgir and Killing Mad Dogs. So yeah, if you want to watch a movie, and that is the only thing that matters to you, if you want a recommendation, I highly recommend Ali Hatami's Mother, and after that, Ali Hatami's Kamal al-Mulk. And after that, definitely Bahman Beyzei's Death of Yazgirt and Killing Mad Dogs. Qaysar, I also recommend, but it is a harder movie to sit through. Also, a little bit of shameless plug. Me and my friend Ami Reza, which you may have remembered from the episode Cats. Sounds cool. Is he mean like a minx? He's actually really kind. No, he's not me. Uh, we have started our own podcast called YASP, short for Yet Another Shitty Podcast. I will put a link to the Anchor webpage in the description. And if you are not tired of hearing me talk, you can follow us there. It's not only about movies, it's movies, TV shows, and games. Well, shameless plug done. And we are talking about Iranian cinema. I can go on, but I don't want to bore you more than I already have. In short, Ali Atami was a very underrated director. Give that man some very well-deserved attention. And if that worked, if this worked, and if that worked, I will see you next time. Thank you.